My name is Soraya, and you are listening to Wild Roots. We know that the biggest threat to the vastly declining wildlife is simply loss of crucial habitat. We humans have spread ourselves far and wide, interrupting natural corridors which wildlife have traveled for hundreds of thousands of years. Wildlife now find themselves at the crossroads with human development and other activities throughout the landscape. Yet, in most of natural history, Wildlife have been able to roam freely across the landscape and over vast distances, a behavior critical to their survival and a natural response to changing seasons and climate. But today, more than ever, we humans have interrupted their life-giving journeys. I think we have the ability to reimagine what these landscapes are, and I think that has the ability to help re form that connection with the natural world that has been lost. In this episode, we will speak with Defenders of Wildlife representative Michael Dax about how we can heal nature's broken habitats by supporting the Wildlife Corridors Act. In our discussion, it is revealed that there is so much more to be reconnected than just habitat alone. So join us today as we reconnect the wild ways. So yeah, so my name is Michael Dax. I'm the New Mexico representative for Defenders of Wildlife. Um, we're a, we are a national nonprofit organization uh, dedicated to the protection of threatened and endangered plants and animals and their habitats throughout North America. Um, and I am based in Santa Fe. I've been here for about four and a half years. And before that, I was uh, living in Montana um, for three years, I was in Yellowstone National Park, and in Yellowstone, I was a tour guide, a bellhop, a ski trail groomer, a cross-country ski instructor, um, and then I w attended the University of Montana, where I got a master's degree in environmental history and studying the attempt to reintroduce grizzly bears to the Bitterroot Mountains of Idaho and Montana in the 1990s that followed wolf reintroduction in that same region. So for those who might not be familiar with this act, could you describe what this act actually is and what this means for wildlife and for people? Yeah, you bet. So uh, this past spring at the legislative session, New Mexico passed the uh, SB 228 the Wildlife Corridors Act. It was sponsored by Senator Mimi Stewart and Representative Georgine Lewis. And what it does is it requires uh, New Mexico Department of Transportation and New Mexico Game and Fish to develop a Wildlife Corridors Action Plan. And that action plan includes um, looking at identifying existing wildlife corridors and barriers to wildlife movement throughout the state and also comes up with a priority list of infrastructure projects what we would call safe passage projects which include underpasses overpasses and fencing that can help facilitate um, safe movement of wildlife which is also has a large benefit for humans as well and more and more in the conservation community there is a realization of these large-scale movements of wildlife. So in Wyoming, researchers have documented these migration, these seasonal migrations um, from deer and pronghorn 
where they're moving as much as a couple hundred miles. And so in the 20th century, largely conservation focused on protecting these island landscapes. So, you know, national parks like Yellowstone and Glacier, uh, Yosemite, the Grand Canyon, and Yellowstone National Park is 2 million acres, so it's, it's very big, but we are beginning to realize that even that is not big enough when we're talking about these much larger movements that, that, um, that wildlife is making. Um, here in New Mexico, we don't necessarily have those really large scale movements where species are predictably moving hundreds of miles on, you know, every, you know, every few months. Um, we do have some large movements where elk and deer are coming out of the mountains of Southern Colorado into the lower country of New Mexico during the winter time. So when we talk about wildlife corridors, um, you know, as much as it's about corridors, it's also about general connectivity and ensuring that the landscape is permeable to wildlife. And so that's when we're starting to talk about roads and fences and places where habitat might be impaired and not allowing the free flow of wildlife. So ultimately, it's about habitat connectivity. And it's a very sad thing to comprehend that we have essentially interrupted these natural migration paths across the landscape to the degree that we have. So what can you tell us about New Mexico's role and involvement regarding this act? Are there any examples in place or specific areas that are being proposed for the installation or management of one of these corridors? So right now, um, just uh, earlier this month at the beginning of July, uh, DOT put out a request for proposals uh, to put together this Wildlife Corridors Action Plan. So as far as the action plan, we're at the very beginning stages of that being put together. And our vision is that that document will be a living document. So as more research and data is available, it will be incorporated into that document so it remains living and becomes an excellent resource for understanding where and how different species are moving throughout the landscape. However, that's not to say that Game and Fish and DOT hasn't already been doing this work. And some of that work has been really successful. So the most well-known project is into Harris Canyon along I-40, just east of Albuquerque. And that came out of a memorial that passed um, about a decade ago. And they have uh, built some underpasses where they uh, um, build fencing that then directs animals to use those underpasses. And they've also um, put in some places where um, if, a, if an animal is uh, moving across the road at surface level, um, that that will trigger some lights so that drivers know to slow down. So they've done that project. Um, they also uh, just completed some fencing south of Cuba on uh, US 550. And there has also been some fencing put up around Farmington um, to protect those animals coming out of Colorado that I mentioned earlier. Um, also later, this year, um, they're going to, there's going to be some construction on I-25 near Raton and the, uh, the New Mexico-Colorado border, and they're going to be putting in a 35-foot underpass. So that's going to be 35 feet wide and 35 feet tall. Um, and the reason why you need those really big ones is because elk and deer don't like using underpasses that are very low because they're prey species. They really need to be able to see and they, they like to be able to see. So the bigger the overpass, the better. Um, and that's one of those things that as uh, past infrastructure has been monitored that we've learned more about, um, about the different requirements for different species. So we're going to be really interested to see what projects uh, get included in that priority list. Um, but at least one that we kind of have our eye on would be another underpass or some sort of infrastructure going under I-25 north of Bernalillo. Um, the, the Pueblo of Santa Ana, uh, their natural resource department has been doing some excellent work over the past number of years to facilitate that movement. And the reason that area is so important is because if we're able to reconnect the Sandias to the Jemez Mountains, we are 
reconnecting two really big pieces of habitat that will benefit everything from mountain lions and black bears to deer and elk. Could you talk a little bit about fencing? Because there are some people who are anti-fencing altogether, and then there are some people who maybe overuse fencing. So the strategic role of fencing plays a significant role in keeping animals safe along these corridors. You know, I certainly understand places where people don't like the idea of fencing just on principle, but right now in New Mexico, or I guess the, the last data that we have available is from 2016, where animal vehicle collisions cost New Mexicans about $20 million when you take into account um, damage to automobiles and healthcare and lost productivity and time at work and things like that, it is hugely impactful to New Mexicans. And unfortunately, these sort of collisions are becoming more and more common. So in 2012, I, I believe, um, there were about 1,200 crashes in New Mexico. By 2016, that had increased to 1,600. So we're seeing about roughly 1,600 crashes per year. And possibly one of the reasons that this is becoming more common is because that animals are moving more. And a lot of that could be because of impacts of climate change. Um, you know, the, the less hospitable former habitats are becoming, the more wildlife are on the move seeking out new places where they can eke out a living. That's right. Climate change is having a huge impact on the way animals are moving throughout the landscape. Just very quickly back to the fencing thing. Um, not long ago, maybe let's see, 2000, in 2015, I believe, I joined uh, Defenders of Wildlife on a volunteer project that focused on the repair and stabilization of fencing along a retired grazing allotment um, within the Gila. And this was an effort to reduce cattle and wolf conflicts. I know this is a little bit off topic, but, but could you talk a little bit about that as well? Yeah, so we did that project along with Wild Earth Guardians. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the, the Deep Creek allotment was, attire, was retired, um, and we're, we're still making sure that those fences are kept up. Um, in that case, it was a, a place where the, the Dark Canyon Pack has often denned. And so even though that allotment has been retired, if the fences aren't maintained and neighboring cattle from neighboring allotments are able to wander on onto the Deep Creek allotment, then um, you know those same problems will persist. So, yeah, there are places where where fences can be strategic, but there's also more and more efforts to remove interior fences and also modify fences so that they're more wildlife friendly. I think the the classic fence is a five strand barbed wire fence. Um, so in places, uh, especially in wildlife sensitive areas. Um, there are opportunities for four-strand barbed wire fences where maybe there's a smooth wire on the top or the bottom um, that will allow um, animals to pass under, over, and be less likely to become entangled. So there are other ways where we're looking at and developing new different you know, types of fences that will allow wildlife to pass over, but maybe to keep livestock in. In addition to looking at large mammals um, like elk and deer and bighorn sheep and bears. Um, we're also looking a lot at aquatic connectivity um, and making sure that our rivers and streams are connected as well so that uh, fish and amphibians and other riparian obligate species have the ability to move across the landscape. Um, so in some places that might be looking at road infrastructure. Um, so, um, uh, a cult, you know, certain kinds of culvert designs, fish are not able to move up those because it channelizes the stream to move too quickly. Uh, in other places, you know, where you might have streams that in the past they were perennial but have become seasonal streams, there are ways to reconnect those streams looking at animals like beavers or techniques like beaver dam analogs that kind of replicate. Uh, the impact of beavers to create connected streams that will allow those species to move up and down systems. I think this because, yeah, and you know, this can become really applicable when you think about wildfires. So the Gila is a great example 
where, where there have been cases of large, really big wildfires that lead to streams becoming totally blown out and all the, the fish um, in those streams being killed. But if those fish have the ability to move downstream and up another tributary that perhaps did not burn, that is a strategy, an adaptation uh, that they can have, but they need to be able to move fully throughout those systems to be able to do things like that. And that's something that people might not have even considered with this Corridors Act, is the aquatic life. Yeah, with corridors, most of the focus is on really large scale issues. And that's great because that's what corridors, I think, is at its core, is it, it's about is looking at landscape level issues to make sure that we're not just, you know, that, that our focus is broad and that we're getting that full picture. But I think corridors as a lens for conservation also gives us the opportunity to look at that micro level um, where we can, you know, where we're not just uh, focused on the big species, the big charismatic species that get most of our attention, but looking at amphibians, um, birds that, that um, live in riparian areas like willow flycatchers, um, or, you know, even things like beavers. Yeah, ju just making sure that all those species, big and small, have the ability to move as needed. And I just wanted to add that you might hear some cicadas in the background as I record this because um, it is that time of year and um, I like my windows open. So admittedly, it's a little bit hard for me to cover, to always cover the human aspect of these wildlife issues because um, I'm mainly focused on rehabilitation and restoration and things like that. But what is the human factor in the uh, Corridors Act and it actually keeps people it actually keeps people safe uh, from human wildlife conflicts and including accidents and things like that. Yeah, he, uh, human safety, public safety is a huge part of this. Uh, and the good news is that from other examples, we know this kind of infrastructure works. Uh, Banff Canada is often, I think, kind of considered the, the poster child of using overpasses and in Banff um, their system of overpasses has reduced all wildlife collisions by 80 percent and then even in Arizona in northern Arizona they have put up some fencing and underpasses on I-17 south of Flagstaff and that has been able to reduce elk collisions by 90 percent so there's no question that there's huge benefits to people um, and we've seen, you know, in their, their major hotspots all around our state uh, for these kind of collisions. Um, Grant County um, is one of the big is one of the big hot hotspots. It has the had the second most collisions in in 2016 um, at 138, and it actually had the highest rate of collisions as well. Um, and then the uh, the Rio Doso area has seen high numbers of collisions as has Raton Pass in the Farmington area as well. So um, these are, you know, and it's, you drive around New Mexico at certain times of year and you're gonna see uh, a deer or an elk um, dead on the side of the highway. So um, there's no question that, you know, these are problems um, that have both a wildlife and a human component. Going back a little bit to cost, uh, people might be reluctant to support such things because of infrastructure costs and things like that. But like the Ben uh, Canada example, these corridors can actually be quite stunning and be considered a unique asset to cities and towns. Definitely, yeah. No, these the, this sort of infra infrastructure definitely has the ability to pay for itself. Um, and I think one thing that's important to note too is that while overpasses um, can be very expensive, underpasses tend to be much less expensive because often what they do is use existing underpasses that are already built into the road because of creeks or the top uh, topography, topography or maybe smaller ranch roads or local roads. And then they use fencing 
um, going in a couple miles in either direction along that main highway to direct animals to use that underpass that is already existing. So oftentimes it doesn't have to be very expensive um, and to achieve a really high benefit. I know you have pretty much covered everything, but is there anything else you might like to add uh, considering these wildlife corridors? You know, very broadly, we are getting to a point where people are increasingly disconnected from the natural world. You know, more and more people are, um, live in cities, uh, spend more time indoors, less time outdoors, and just have less knowledge about wildlife, how they use the landscape, you know, what is dictating their movements on a daily and seasonal basis. And we think of, when we think of wildlife conservation, we think of it as something that's in the mountains, that's where wildlife is. Um, you know, it's in this place when we, you know, when we go up into the forest for the weekend, that's when we're gonna see wildlife. But I think when we start talking about wildlife corridors, and we're thinking about these landscapes on a much larger and broader scale and that the Hamas are connected to the Sandias, or at least they should be, and that's connected to parts of northern New Mexico and the, um, the Sangre de Cristo are connected to the, to the eastern plains of New Mexico. I think we have the ability to reimagine what these landscapes are. And I think that has the ability to help reform that connection with the natural world that has been lost. And I know that there, there, you know, we will see what gets included in the list of priority projects. But one thing that has been kind of kicked around as an idea is to build the state's first overpass into Harris Canyon to further improve some of that work that's already been done. And I think one of the reasons that would that would be so valuable is the educational opportunity of thousands of people who drive that road on a daily basis, having the ability to see that overpass on their daily commutes. And it might not be the first time that they cross under that overpass where they think, well, what is that thing? But eventually they're gonna wonder what is that thing? And maybe they have the opportunity to see a bighorn sheep or an elk use that overpass and think about the educational opportunity of rekindling that connection with the natural world and that curiosity that has been lost. And that to me is just so exciting. Well, I'm glad I asked you for something to add because that was quite beautiful. Thank you. So Michael, do you have a story about a special experience or connection that you have made in nature or with an animal that you could share with us today? So especially for my, my time in Yellowstone, um, I, I have a number of experiences with wildlife, but probably the most memorable was hiking on the east side of Yellowstone Lake, uh, going down towards the thoroughfare, which is the southeast corner of Yellowstone and probably one of the wildest places in the 48 states. And we were hiking along and it was thick old growth forest. And we came around a bend and a pack of wolves was running right towards us. And they stopped and we stopped and they were probably only about 75 feet away from us when they stopped. And they started kind of scattering and one wolf started slowly walking towards us. So we took a, a single step kind of into the, into the forest so that there just be a little bit of a barrier between us and the wolves. And about 15 seconds passed and the wolf hadn't passed us yet, um, which it should have just based on how far, far it was away. And so we stepped back out onto the trail. And then at that point, there was just a single wolf about 150 feet down the trail. And as soon as it saw us, it jetted into the woods. And about 10 minutes later, we heard them howling um, to, to regroup. And you know, it wasn't the first time I'd seen wolves. By that point, I'd seen a lot of wolves in Yellowstone, but most of the time it was from the road. I, I was driving or I just pulled over. And so just hiking through the woods and encountering this, you know, this literal pack of wild dogs running through the woods um, was such a magical moment uh, to just, you know, see them that up close 
and looking as as wild as they were as opposed to you know when you're up in Lamar Valley and you're standing there with a hundred other people with spotting scopes um, because people have been tracking those packs for you know months and weeks at a time and know exactly how they're moving but to just bump into this pack in the woods you know encounters humans far less frequently was such a um, As wildlife continue to feel the constriction of human encroachment, they take refuge in the interiors of the last remaining intact ecosystems in which they can still thrive. It is crucial that we mend our broken landscape, the habitat we share with all other wild living creatures. Habitat connectivity will allow life to flow, flourish, and thrive all around us providing the circulatory system of our planet's life blood, the diverse creatures that make up our beloved Earth. This is Wild Roots. Thanks for listening.